Hello everyone. Finding out that you are highly sensitive was in all likelihood a powerful, transformative experience. All of a sudden things started making sense. The different pieces of your life's puzzle finally fell into place, and it just clicked, and you finally understood. I think all HSPs are affected strongly by this. How can you not have a strong emotional reaction to finding a book or a concept that at once explains most of the mysteries of your life and of yourself? This knowledge by itself is liberating, and there follows a period of reframing where every single thing is considered of one's newly made discovery, in light of one's newly made discovery. It's definitely an interesting time to be alive. In my experience, this dynamic period of constant change and turbulence that inevitably comes along with trying to assimilate all the new pieces of information may last several months or even a couple of years. There's just so much to process, so much to think about, so much to reconsider and reassess. Yet, as overwhelming as this period can be, it's also wonderful to gain such intimate and profound knowledge about your life and about, your, about yourself. It can't but feel good to finally get rid of the veil and see clearly whatever is behind it. It truly is a revelation of sorts, or at the very least, a strong aha moment. In this period, you'll often be swayed by strong emotions, and so you'll tend to make broad generalizations and see things as more black and white than they may actually be. I honestly think this is inevitable and perfectly fine. However, the generalizations and the emotional swings that come with such black and white thinking can be anticipated and their severity ameliorated and dealt with tactfully. That way, when you do have to make some future adjustments and corrections, you can do so relatively smoothly. So today I'd like us to address two errors, or perhaps better, two rather bold presumptions the highly sensitive person almost cannot avoid, avoid making in this rather revolutionary period. The first presumption is that all HSPs are alike, or that the differences that set them apart are negligible, and that we're basically talking about a generally homogenous group. The second presumption is, of course, that all HSPs are like oneself, or, at the very least, are similar to oneself. The initial strong emotions make both practically impossible to avoid. I mean, it finally dawns on you that there is an organizing principle that explains most of the things that have seemed so difficult to account for in your life. And what's more, it's not just you. You find out, uh, you find out that there are others like you out there as well. In such circumstances, it's practically impossible to not presume that 1. All HSPs are pretty much the same, and 2. They're all very similar to me. I'm talking about this, uh, I'm talking about all of this on an emotional, not fully conscious level. Of course, rationally, you're aware that that isn't the case. That's why in her books, Elaine Aaron makes sure to point out on numerous, numerous occasions just how much HSPs do, in fact, differ. Quote, does is a wonderful general guideline for understanding high sensitivity, as is the research on what the average HSP is like on various measures or in different situations, or even how their brain functions. But you are unique, not identical to a general description or like any statistically average, actually non-existent person. Ever seen a family with 2.12 with children? You know you also differ moment to moment. For example, depending on how you're feeling, you may not reflect before acting or notice subtleties even as much as those around you who do not have the trait. HSPs also differ enormously from each other. We have other traits, different histories, and are just different. In our enthusiasm to identify ourselves as a group, even as a misunderstood minority, I hope not too much of that, we do not want to forget that we are not identical by any means. A couple of pages later, in the same book, so in the preface of The Highly Sensitive Person in Love, the 2020 edition, she continues, quote, This book involves seeing yourself as having a trait common to many. That is, it labels you. The advantages are that you can feel normal and benefit from the experience and, and research of others. But any label misses your uniqueness. HSPs are each utterly different, even with their common trait. Please remind yourself of that as you proceed. So, once you realize you are in fact quite different from others that do not possess the trait, you're bound to project your own traits onto a fictitious, highly sensitive, prototypical other. That is, unless you already know enough HSPs to have first-hand experience of how different uh, they can be, which is probably unlikely. 
Also, one should keep in mind that uh, saying that um, also one should keep in mind the saying that birds of a feather flock together. So even if you do know a couple of HSPs, that doesn't mean they're good representatives of all of the highly sensitive people out there. Now, when talking of projection, I really think it's oftentimes just a more technical way of saying you don't expect in others what you don't find in yourself. And that's perfectly natural. All humans are prone to thinking this way. We're all prone to making such mistakes. In fact, even trained professionals are not immune. As proof, here are two quotes from Elaine Aaron's Psychotherapy and the Highly Sensitive Person, which is of course a book primarily intended for psychotherapists. The following ad advice with, was written with them in mind, that is, mental health professionals. Quote, beware of making the common human assumption that others are like you. And a couple of pages later, she discusses the advantages and disadvantages of a highly sensitive therapist working with a highly sensitive client. Quote, in short, there would seem to be little adaptation needed. However, even when sensitive therapists are at home with their trait, there are pitfalls here. One is assuming the patient is similar in other ways as well. For example, I tend to expect highly sensitive patients to be introverts like me, but some are not. I may ask them to remind me when I am assuming it, and I have to adapt myself to sensitive extroverts' way of thinking. I may also assume a sensitive patient has the same limitations and preferences I have. So she herself freely admits it's hard to not think of other highly sensitive people uh, um, as similar to oneself. And she basically says you have to keep reminding yourself mindfully that there may very well be significant differences that simply haven't surfaced yet. So basically the point of today's talk is to do just that. It's to mindfully acknowledge the fact and remind ourselves that as much as we are similar, and we are remarkably similar, often even eerily so, Despite these similarities, there are also noticeable marked differences. And it's those differences that tend to get overlooked in the initial emotional and exciting phase where we're, where we're just trying to make sense of it all. I mean, just thinking about it on the fly, we can immediately agree on obvious important differences. Some HSPs are born to families that are well off, while others are born to families that struggle financially. Some grow up in secular societies, other in religious ones. Some live in big cities, while others live in the countryside. Some grow up, grow up in a peaceful time and place, others grow up surrounded by ethnic tensions or outright war. Some have two parents, some have one parent, and some have no parents. You get the point. These differences are far from negligible. In fact, I wouldn't even say they're small. They can have huge implications for the development or the expression of the trait. So, to not go through every possible difference we can think of today, I'd like us to focus on two main points that can always help us think, of, think um, about HSPs in more variety and more detail than merely by means of introspection. Introspection has its place and is no doubt very valuable, but it can be limiting as well. Today, we'll just touch, touch on the matter, and perhaps we'll dedicate separate talks to each subject in the future. So, one of, the, uh, one of the most important, if not the most important difference is, of course, due to different attachment styles. So, very briefly on attachment theory. Basically, in the first few months and years of life, we form a general idea of the world out there. The first relationship or interaction with our parents, and with our mother in particular, is our first interaction with the wor world itself, with existence. The mother is the infant's world in a more than metaphorical sense, as the baby was, was physically part of her not long ago. And so, going by what the baby experiences in mom and dad, or through mom and dad, he or she forms no less monumental an idea or a hypothesis than one of the entire world, so to speak. This idea generally persists throughout the entirety of, of one's life. I don't know what the latest verdict is on how much attachment styles can be altered, but generally they're thought to be quite resilient to change. So in those first few months and years of life, we generally um, either learn to think of the word world as a safe and predictable place, or as a less than safe and unpredictable one. The former attitude is what we call a secure attachment style, and the latter an insecure one, of which there are several subtypes. The subtypes in essence being different solutions to the same problem of a less than, less than safe world. So it's only natural that secure HSPs differ markedly from insecure HSPs. I'd advise you to read up on attachment styles and try to find out which one you can relate to the most. 
And also, don't feel bad if you find out you, you relate most strongly to an insecure attachment style. About half of the population today is insecurely attached. Yes, that's right. Every other person is insecurely attached. Anyway, the first point is attachment styles. Once you learn to recognize them, you'll be able to quickly use, use them to better understand people in general, and that includes HSPs, of course. They help tremendously in understanding and to a certain extent predicting human behavior. Also, they're honestly not that difficult to spot once you take the time to learn about them. The second point we will address is simply other personality traits. Elaine Aaron focuses most on sensation-seeking, and she explores the matter in the highly sensitive person in love. It's a trait independent of high sensitivity. Uh, that is to say, you can be high or low on one, the other, or both. Quote, Marvin Zuckerman, who has um, most researched this other trait, calls it high sensation seeking. According to Zuckerman, high sensation seekers seek varied, novel, complex, and intense sensations and experiences, and are willing to take physical, social, legal, and financial risks for the sake of such experiences. Genetic, genetic studies have found that this trait is as much determined by genes as is a person's height, so that's a lot. And these physical differences are seen in the first days of life, as high levels of activity in babies who will become HSSs. So that's a brief description of the trait of high sensation seeking. In the paragraph that follows the quote we just read, so also from the highly sensitive person in love, Aaron continues by comparing high sensation seeking to high sensitivity. Quote, being an HSS, easily bored, and therefore eager to take risks in order to try new things, would seem to be just the opposite of a, of a highly sensitive person. But it is not at all. These two traits are completely independent of each other. You can be high on one, high on the other, high on both, or low on both. And some people have moderate levels of one or the other, although moderation seems to be more the case with sensation-seeking than sensitivity. However, the most surprising result, again, is that someone can be an HSP and an HSS. So, Erin thinks sensation-seeking to be so important that she freely talks about for groups of people. And you can find that on page 36 of The Highly Sensitive Person in Love. The four groups are, of course, the four, the four combinations of HSP slash non-HSP and HSS slash non-HSS. And again, if interested, you can read up on all of them in the highly sensitive person and love. So to bring this talk to an end, today we've touched on two important things pertaining to the differences found among HSPs, and those are attachment style and other personality traits. We focused on high sensation seeking as an example of a trait that can make two HSPs seem two HSPs seem remarkably different, or even utterly different, despite having a lot in common, and definitely enough in common to merit the same label of highly sensitive. Some HSPs enjoy climbing or other rather extreme sports, while others wouldn't be caught dead doing them, and so on and so on. There are there are of course many more things we could talk about. The point is just to raise awareness of the fact that, similar as HSPs are, they still come in many different shapes and sizes. Keeping that in mind might help you navigate that initial phase of living with your newly discovered trait more successfully. So, to recap, in your initial enthusiasm or excitement, you'll uh, just be aware of the fact that as an HSP that, that, that has recently become self-aware, you will be prone to making the false assumption that one, all HSPs are alike, and two, they're all like you. Just being mindful of that can make a lot of things at least uh, somewhat smoother in this ra rather turbulent initial phase. I thank you for watching, I wish you all the best, and take care.